Welcome back to this third lecture on group equivariant deep learning. In this uh, sequence of videos, we're going to cover the topic of equivariant uh, graph neural networks, uh, where the previous uh, videos focused primarily on the, the computer vision uh, setting. Uh, we see that uh, uh, when we move to, let's say, the computational sciences, like computational chemistry, computational physics, but also medical image analysis, we, we need a more uh, flexible framework than uh, the CNN framework. And, well, once you talk about flexible frameworks, I think graph neural networks are uh, the way to go. So in this sequence of videos, it's all about graph neural networks, how to make them equivariant, and uh, really understand uh, the theory uh, behind them. Um, yeah, so let's start off again with an overview of what to expect in uh, this, uh, the following videos. We'll start off with a motivation for equivariant uh, graph neural networks with some examples coming from uh, the scientific uh, domains. And so the focus of this lecture is on graph neural networks and uh, the most flexible approach or generic approach to building graph neural networks is via this uh, message passing uh, framework. So uh, that's going to be introduced in lecture 3.2. We're going to introduce the message passing framework, how to make it equivariant, and once you made it equivariant, how we can think of them as uh, a form of nonlinear convolutions. And I think that's a nice intuition to keep in the back of your mind that if you're working with equivariant message passing, uh, you're essentially doing something that is much more powerful than, um, let's say, the linear group convolutional uh, uh, counterparts. So, um, okay, that, that's something that I want to explain and introduce in lecture 3.2. And what follows is actually the idea that um, in this message passing, you want to condition a certain functions, your MLPs, on certain geometric quantities. And how this is typically done is via a tensor product. And I'm going to explain that this tensor product is actually a very natural uh, operator uh, to use to construct your conditional uh, linear layers and your conditional multilayer perceptrons. And so I decided to spend uh, a separate video on this uh, idea because uh, building architectures were mostly used to using uh, like linear layers, right? So we built MLT MLPs by linear layers. Uh, interleave with nonlinear activation functions, but we're not so used uh, to working with tensor products. So I'm going to show that we can think of tensor product as uh, conditional linear layers. Uh, okay, so these are sort of uh, generic approaches to building graph neural networks, but then we want to make them equivalent, right? And so we have to learn again a bit more about representation th theory because and uh, when we move to the SE3 case, the steerability uh, ID uh, becomes uh, really important. And um, then it's good to know the terminology and know the tools, like the main tool that we see pop up in all these equivalent graph neural networks uh, papers is this Klebsch Gordon tensor product. So that's going to be the focus of lecture 3.4, that you have a solid understanding of the underlying theory, of course, uh, coupled with examples. Okay, and then in uh, the remaining part of this lecture, we're going to uh, go over uh, a couple of papers uh, coming from this gr group equivariant graph neural network uh, field uh, covering, uh, let's say, um, a category of steerable uh, graph convolutional neural networks and show how the Klebsch Gordon tensor product plays a role there. But we're also going to discuss, let's say, the regular convolutional counterparts uh, to this in the, the graph neural network setting. Because also in the graph neural network framework, I think it's natural to make this distinction between steerable uh, uh, equivalent methods and, let's say, regular group convolutional uh, neural networks. And then finally, I would like to end this, this lecture with uh, gauge equivalent graph neural networks, where we sort of push this uh, flexibility of graph neural networks and equivalent graph neural networks to really uh, the extremes where we are able to build locally equivalent graph neural networks that are applicable uh, in, a, in a wide, wide range of, uh, of data structures. So not necessarily uh, images or point clouds, but manifolds in general. Um, and when I say manifolds, maybe you can think of, of, of shapes uh, uh, that need to be processed.
Okay, so this this lecture is all about uh, 3D equivalent uh, graph neural networks. So um, problems that have to deal with uh, three-dimensional symmetries. And we're going to do that via the graph neural network framework because that is such a flexible framework to build learning architectures with it. Um, so let's start off with the computa computational physics uh, domain. Here it's actually super natural, especially in this case, uh, to talk about graph neural networks, right? Um, for example, if we talk about this N body simulations where we have all these particles that uh, attract each other and we're observing the dynamics. We want to uh, generate the, these motion paths of all these particles. Yeah, we can think of it as having indeed a bunch of nodes or the particles that all attract each other, right? Uh, they all interact in some way with each other and that determines um, their traje trajectories. So that explains the graph neural network parts, but of course we also need to respect the actual physical constraints of this uh, system, right? So we're, we're talking about particles that have uh, velocities uh, or forces uh, acting on them. And obviously this whole system of particles together with their velocities and forces should, um, you know, should transform equivalently. If I rotate the system, the dynamics should uh, uh, shift in a predictable way. Okay, so for these kind of uh, problems, we really need equivalent uh, graph neural networks. So what I did on this slide, I provided a bunch of references to get you started in, in each of these uh, disciplines. And this, this figure actually came from a recent paper, Geometric and Physical Quantities, Improve E3 Equivalent Message Passing. And this is actually going to be um, mentioned several times in these uh, upcoming videos because it covers uh, this topic of steerability, uh, like a klebsch gordon tensor product in this 3D graph neural network setting. But it also introduces a notion of equivalent uh, message passing as a form of nonlinear convolutions, which I think is a nice perspective to have when uh, discussing this uh, equivalent graph neural network um, uh, field. So we will learn more about that in the subsequent uh, videos. Uh, but if you're interested in just a, a high level overview of what's happening in this computational or in, let's say in this AI for physics uh, domain, I think this is a nice uh, paper to, to start off with. It's a white paper on symmetry group equivalent architectures for physics. So it sketches uh, a high level overview of the field and also very explicitly states uh, the, the advantages of handling your symmetries uh, via well, equivalent architectures. Then let's move on to, to the computational chemistry domain. Here, of course, it's also very obvious that we need to uh, work with equivalent architectures, right? Uh, for example, a molecule uh, has certain properties and these properties should remain invariant uh, regardless of what orientation uh, the molecule is analyzed, uh, right? Uh, so, okay, so we have this equivalence constraints, of course, but also we have this idea of weight sharing, right? That uh, there's a lot of symmetries that we can leverage to uh, learn more efficiently our representations uh, of molecules. And this is especially important if you talk about uh, materials or like crystalline structures where we really have all these repetitive patterns and we uh, do not want to relearn features separately for every symmetry that is in the, uh, these patterns. We just want the neural network to, to learn one canonical representation and reuse it for every instances, uh, instance of such uh, a symmetry. Now, I think if you're interested in learning a bit more about uh, well, geometric deep learning on uh, molecular representations, so that's this paper, really check out this paper. I think it's a nice uh, it sketches nicely a bit the historical context from where we went from uh, processing molecules with smile strings to really processing uh, these molecules with equivalent or geometric uh, deep learning methods. Maybe let's have a quick look at this paper. So uh, this figure already uh, is a nice overview of different type of uh, approaches or data formats in which we can process uh, our molecules. And I think most recently we see um, that these molecules are typically represented as a point cloud or as a graph. Uh, well, atoms have um, a location in space and there's this connectivity. And we want to process that in an equivalent way. And uh, so that's discussed here in this paper as well. So principles of geometric deep learning, talking about asymmetries, equivalence and invariance. Um, yeah, it covers different type of approaches, like really the graph neural networks, the point cloud method, mesh-based uh, methods, transformers, equivalent message passing, so that will be the topic of uh, the next video, 
and, and, and symmetries and all. So I think this is really a, a nice starting point to get acquainted uh, uh, with the field. It doesn't go into much detail um, with respect to the representation theory and the actual uh, group theory behind uh, everything, but that's going to be the focus of uh, this lecture series, of course. Okay, and then I want to mention that also in the 3D computer vision domain, uh, equivalence pops up a lot of times uh, because we're dealing here with, with shapes and uh, really geometric objects, right? And uh, so, for example, if this airplane and we want to identify several, several parts of such a shape, uh, then we want the neural network to be able to distinguish the nose from the tail, for example, equally well, regardless of the pose of this plane. And also uh, when turning point clouds into meshes or shapes, we want to respect um, well the geometric nature of these uh, data structures. Um, so also here I selected some references that I think are nice, uh, starting off actually with this uh, capsule net viewpoint, which I also talked about in, in the first lecture. Um, so the fun thing about these capsules is that they really are after equivalent representations, but uh, it's designed in such a way that you let the neural network learn this, but in a very well thought through uh, approach uh, to it. And that creates this hierarchical idea of recognition by components. And I wanted to briefly uh, show this paper um, because it, it may, to complete the storyline from where um, on the one hand side we can build very flexible methods that learn to be equivalent and that's actually done in this particular paper via uh, equivalence and invariance uh, losses. So th these are properties that we want the neural network to, to have and that's enforced via uh, loss functions. Uh, where you generally want such a commutation diagram to hold, right? If I am able to recognize the components in a plane, let's say, under one pose, I also want to be able to do that under a different pose. And we uh, should be able to transition between the two. And that sort of guarantees via this equivalence constraint in a, a capsule uh, neural network uh, setting. All right, but as we have seen uh, several times now already, we can also hard code such equivalence constraints into the neural network. And that's uh, what uh, the authors of this paper uh, did, self-supervised canonicalization of 3D poses, uh, pose for partial shapes. Uh, in this paper, they hard baked this equivalence constraint into the neural networks. Uh, so I want to show this paper because it's an example of a uh, group equivalent capsule network. So it addresses the same uh, problem as before as the recognition by components, uh, like you know, splitting our object into several uh, different components, but do this in an equivalent way. And um, um, let's see, so the, the central uh, method to this is the use of tensor field networks. And this is going to be uh, explained in detail in uh, the upcoming uh, video. So we want to work with equivalent or invariant embeddings of features such as relative positions. So that's re really going to be the topic of this whole lecture. And uh, yeah, this is then uh, an overview of the method that we see this tensor field networks, this equivalent uh, neural network part uh, pop up uh, in this place. And we see that in a lot of papers that we're going to discuss in this, in this lecture. So Working with these tensor products, equivalent tensor products, that's going to be the central theme uh, in, in this lecture. Okay, and then when talking about equivalent uh, neural networks in 3D, I really wanted to mention also this paper, which is really nice. So let's have a quick look at it. Now, the reason I like this paper is because it very clearly motivates this need for equivalent methods, right? It's, it's really wasteful to process these type of data structures without respecting uh, the underlying geometry. You're wasting a lot of uh, data and compute if you're not encode these symmetries in your uh, neural networks. So you get more uh, efficient with these uh, equivalent architectures. But they also like it because it connects uh, nice to this uh, the subsequent videos and this equivalent neural network field as a whole, where we focus a lot on representation theory of the three-dimensional rotation uh, group. So that's going to be covered in the, the lectures. And maybe this is also a nice example later on if you want to uh, look back at how is this applied in practice in, uh, let's say, a non-computational chemistry domain, because that will be a large focus of the lectures. Uh, but for example, in computer vision, I think this is a nice uh, paper uh, to check out. Okay, now and finally talking about 3D equivalence and maybe somewhat unusual data structures, 
Um, I really also have to mention this medical image analysis application of diffusion weighted MRI, where via a particular MRI acquisition, we can measure the diffusivity of water molecules uh, in the brain. And um, this is interesting because uh, the brain is composed of all these, 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 these wires, right? The neurons that have some uh, uh, orientation to them. And water diffuses uh, faster along these, these fibers uh, more than uh, orthogonal to them. And that creates these uh, directional uh, responses, which can be represented in these glyph plots. So what's actually being obtained here is data that lives on the space R3 by S2. For every point and for every direction, I have a diffusivity uh, response. And this can be recognized as a homogeneous space. Uh, so this can be recognized as a homogeneous space, SE3. Um, with SO2 quotient out. And yeah, so I want to mention this because you see now a whole variety of different type of applications that all use the same type of machinery, namely group theory uh, corresponding to the SE3 or Euclidean motion group in 3D, all based on this eclipse gordon uh, tensor product. So I think it's very important that we learn properly about um, well, uh, representation TV uh, for, for 3D uh, transformation groups. Now, this particular figure came from uh, a book chapter that I wrote with my uh, co-promoter uh, a while back. And I wanted to show this because it um, is an example of, let's say, um, an old school way of, of data processing. So actually nothing is deep learning in this paper, but it uses all the same tools that we're discussing and have been discussing over uh, the past couple of videos, like uh, in a group theoretical setting, processing data with uh, group theoretical uh, tools. And the reason why I wanted to show this paper is to show that uh, um, there's this whole field of group equivalent um, image analysis where also here data is not processed on the, the let's say, 2D images, but it's first list, lifted to a function on the group and processed there. And then in this lifted space, we can use a lot of tools from differential geometry, for example, to solve PDEs or to detect patterns um, and maybe to compute shortest paths in these lifted uh, spaces. And so that's also the idea what, what we've been talking about in this group theoretical setting, right? Where we have an image, we apply a lifting convolution to have this higher dimensional representation. We do processing there. And in this particular case, in the classic set setting, we solve PDEs, for example, for uh, vessel tracking or uh, image enhancement. And so maybe I want to show some medical applications here, for example, a vessel tracking in 2D or 3D. But also once we have these lifted representations, we can do all sorts of interesting analysis. For example, look at that, how quickly structures change their orientation. And that says something about the curvature of the underlying uh, line structure, which could be used as biomarkers in the medical image analysis domain. Um, but we could also um, use these kind of tools for image enhancement. both in the 2D or 3D domain. So these are the kind of glyph plots that we will also see when we talk about uh, processing uh, molecular uh, data. So for diffusion MRI, we use the same tools as we use for uh, these equivalent uh, graph neural networks. And yeah, so these, these tools have a, a wide range of applications in the medical image uh, analysis domain. Uh, yeah, so this introductory video shows that um, even though we have this wide range of different types of applications, when, once we start talking about 3D um, uh, data structures and we have to deal with equivalence constraints, we end up with the same computational tools. And the main computational tools uh, tool that is going to be discussed in this lecture is this Klebsch Gordon tensor product. We really see it pop up in all these equivalent neural network uh, papers, so it's time uh, we learn a bit more about it.